Welcome to the capital of Poland, Warsaw. Welcome to day one of my time in the capital city, commonly known as Warsaw to many. I'm going to go visit some castles, I'm going to see some history, the old town, basically the older parts of the city. So come along with me and explore, but first I am starving and Poland does the best baked goods, so I'm going to have some of that. Well, how nice is this? Underneath the tall skyscrapers of the city is Ugrud Saki, which means Saxon garden. And actually that makes sense. Uh, it's very much something like we would have in the UK. Now, obviously it's winter time at the moment, so there's not a lot. It's still quite gray and, and drab. However, lots of people out here sitting down, relaxing, just walking through. Uh, what I've noticed is obviously because it's winter time, a lot of the fountains aren't actually active at the moment. But check this out, we're just about to come to lots of statues and a really big fountain, so let's check this out. There are a lot of these statues and they are called the personification of music. In essence, it is the beauty and emotions of music in human form. I think they're pretty cool, right? And the real centre point to this park is Fontana Vielka. I'm going to try and put up some pictures of this when it's springtime or summertime so you can see the real beauty of it and when, for example, the fountain is actually working with water in. But it's just a lovely little spot, isn't it? This is, this is what you need in a, in a big city full of, well, tall skyscrapers and industrial areas. You need these spaces for people to relax, to walk through, just to bring everyone a little bit of calm and down to earth. On from the gardens is Pilsudski Square, but in between is the tomb of the unnamed soldier. I'm going to try and say that in Polish. Grub Nieżnego Żołnierza. And this is for all of the soldiers that have fought for Polish freedom that haven't been named. You get these all over the world and there are these tombs. There's a special changeover happening today. So you've got Polish soldiers here, but it's a really special place where people can just remember. I think that's the main thing. Remember the people that aren't named. This structure was originally a part of the Saxon palace and now you've got the eternal flame in the background and it is guarded by ceremonial guards at all times. Oh wow. Amazing, right? It's just a real hot spot for just showing that respect. We're watching. How special was that? This was not something I expected to see today. Moving, right? It's really, really moving because I think we should all remember the sacrifices that other people have made so we can have our freedom, as they say. But that was incredible. <laughs> I just, a little bit moved by it, a little bit moved by it. 
And Poland does this very well. And you've got to think, Poland has been through so much over the years. They have been the hot spot. Motorbike. They have been the hot spot of war. At Warsaw, has basically been destroyed. We'll get into that later on. You can see we're starting to get out of the main city now uh, with all the modern. We're coming into what is a little bit older. Here behind me is the statue of Adam Mickiewicz, and he was a Polish romantic poet. Now, when the Germans came, they destroyed this, but in the 1950s, it was re-erected, and now it's a symbol of the Polish strength and their resilience to everything that they've suffered. The river's gonna cry when you're gone. This is a nice atmosphere here. We are just about to head into the old town, which is just in front of me. There are all these beautiful buildings. There are street performers, and I think there's gonna be more in the old town in a minute. Well, I've reached the Rinek, the Market Square. It seems like they're only just packed away from Christmas and it's the start of March. Anyway, in the middle is the symbol of Warszawa, and that is the mermaid, the Serena in Polish. Now, she was swimming from the Baltic Sea and decided to come up the Vistula River. Fishermen saw lots of splashing around and they realized that she was caught in their nets. So, because of her beautiful singing, they decided to let her go and freed her. However, a rich merchant decided to capture her again and try and make profit. But because of those fishermen who were enchanted, they let her go, they freed her, they rescued her. And because of that, she said she would protect the city and the people of Warszawa. There are a few of these statues around and it doesn't just show the myths and the legends of Warszawa, but it also shows the resilience of its people and it's a brilliant reminder of that. Warszawa's Rynek is a lot different to the other two cities, Krakow and Wrocław's market squares that I've been to. It's a lot smaller. This doesn't seem like the main hub of the city, unlike those other two, Krakow and Wrocław where everything centers around their Rinex. That's not the case here. I think the more of a center point for tourists and things is back in the older town uh, where we came in from by the palace. Let's go and explore some more down these back streets. Yeah, this part definitely caters more for the tourists with overpriced foods uh, such as zipakankas, uh, lode, which is ice cream, uh, pierogi, which is not cheap. <laughs> Uh, but they know that the tourists are sort of coming through here, sort of en route to different places. So, yeah, don't get food from here. So it's a bit of a trap, I feel. Well, surrounding the old town is the Barbican. Now, this was constructed in the 16th century to defend the old town. But, obviously, it needed to be reconstructed in the middle 19th century because of those bloody Germans. <laughs> Well, I hope you're getting the idea that Warszawa 
was really flattened and needed to do a lot of reconstruction after World War II because of those pesky Germans and then the Soviet chaos that they caused afterwards. But there we go, we've left the old town. It's quite an impressive Barbican though. Looks really, really good and it's just surrounding the Rinek and the palace. But it would have been a lot bigger, a lot longer, but things aren't as they were. But Warsaw did a really, really good job of trying to rebuild exactly how it actually was originally, which is impressive. And actually, if you didn't know the history, I don't think you would know that a lot of Warsaw is reconstructed as it was, which is quite impressive, right? But it's busy. I'm surprised how busy it here that uh, it is here, considering it's the start of March, it's not really a season, it's not summer, it's not Christmas time. But this is a place that tourists come to, and I think you've got to. It's like going to London. You have to go to London. I don't think London's very good, but it's something you have to do. You have to visit the sites and the, the main cities, right? In 1940, the German occupation authorities created a ghetto that was separate to the main city. It housed over 300,000 Warsaw Jews and then another 90,000 plus from outside the city. Around 100,000 Jews died of hunger. And then in 1942, the Germans deported and murdered 300 plus thousand in the gas chambers of Treblinka. Then in April of 1943, an uprising took place, but the Germans ended up murdering the remainder of the Jews. This part of the wall is left here and this is a reminder of what happened. Almost a year and a half after the ghetto uprising, on the 1st of August 1944, there was the Warsaw Uprising. It was horrific, and we've come to the Warsaw Uprising Museum to find out a little bit more about what happened. To briefly explain the Warsaw Uprising, the German Nazis had control of Warsaw, but the Polish Home Army, the resurgence, wanted to take it back. But after 63 days they had to surrender because the Soviets didn't help them at all and after that the Germans took them to the concentration camps murdered thousands and thousands it was a it was a disaster the Germans destroyed the city and it was in ruins and that is when the Soviets came in a few months later and controlled Poland until 1989 before World War II Warsaw had a population of 1.3 million. As of January 1945, the population was 1,000. That is the devastation that was caused by the war and the Germans. The Polish government were underground. They were in sewers. They wanted to be the rightful, legitimate government of Poland. They created Operation Tempest, or in Polish, Operacja Berzia, to coincide with the Red Soviet Army coming west. They organized the Warsaw Uprising as well as other cities in Poland. But when it was time, the Soviet army stayed on the east side of the Vistula River. They put their arms down and they didn't help. So it was a disaster. It, there was success, but overall it was a disaster for the Poles. And then obviously, as we said earlier, when 
the Germans had left and the population and city had been destroyed, that's when the Soviets decided it was their time to come in and take Poland for themselves. It wasn't just men fighting in this resistance, it was women and it was children. It just shows the widespread national commitment to get rid of the German occupation. On July 21st, 1944, Moscow Radio announced the formation of the Polish Committee of National Liberation, which was actually formed by Polish communists based in Moscow under Stalin's orders. After taking control of the so-called Lublin Poland, they created real terror and oppression of the underground resistance. By April 1945, over 100 Home Army officers were murdered in Lublin Castle, which actually was formerly the home of the Gestapo. And on December 31st, 1944, the Polish Committee of National Liberation was converted into the Polish interim government. But it was only run by Polish communists. In the aftermath of World War II, on June 1945, the leaders of the underground Home Army movement that were involved in the Warsaw Uprising were, under false pretenses, invited to Moscow to meet with the Soviets. Now, it was under false pretenses because they were expecting a Polish-Soviet agreement to work together. When they got to Moscow, they were arrested and they were tried. Now, a lot of them got long sentences. Some of them got death sentences, which actually never actually took place. All of them ended up dying, though, in Soviet prisons. Unfortunately, World War II did not end at the same time for Poland as it did for the rest of us. That was truly incredible, that visit. If you are in Warsaw, then make sure you go to the Uprising Museum. It was just fascinating, and it has so much history about during and after the war that most people don't know about. It's the hardship that the Poles had to go through just to be Poland. It's, it's mad to think, and the sacrifices that so many men, women, and children made it's unreal, but I am gonna head back to my apartment and I will see you when it's time for dinner to see what is going into my belly. Well, it's about four hours later and on the way back from the museum to the apartment, I stumbled across something amazing. It is called Food Town. Yes, uh, I was thinking, where am I gonna go for dinner tonight? And I have found it. I had a look inside and it is a food court, but Oh my God, there are so many different types of food. It is incredible. The food looks really good quality. So I'm gonna show you inside and we'll see what I choose for dinner tonight. I can tell you're waiting in serious anticipation for what I got. I have gone for beef udon noodles. It looks delicious. Uh, 38 zwote, which is about eight pounds, which is pretty good for this. Let's give it a try. Mmm. That is really good. The thing. The thing I'm noticing about this food hall is that the quality of all of the food places looks really good. Yeah, there might be some that are a little bit dingy, but 90% of them are really good quality looking. Annoyingly, I wanted to go for ramen and I wanted to go for dim sum together. 
because I love dim sum, I love ramen. They didn't have any ramen, so I thought, let's, let's change the plan. But this is not the only food I'll be getting. I've got to go some Polish, right? So I'm going to eat this, and for dessert, yeah, there's a dessert. It might be a little bit more Polish. Dessert has arrived. We have got pierogi z wiznia. So, cherry pierogi. Uh, I'm going to try this. It, hopefully, it is delicious. Oh, God. Hang on. It's quite... Oh, I think they put butter underneath it. Ugh. Not a fan of butter, but let's give it a go anyway. Mmm. It was a little bit different to the sweet pierogi I had at home. Because the cherry, it's almost like there's two full cherries in there, but obviously where they've been cooked, they go a little bit squishy. There's not really any syrup in it, which is a shame. However, I do have some cream type yogurty, can't remember, uh, what do you call it? I can't remember now. Anyway, let's see if this helps. Oh, mm. the sharpness of the cherry, the sweetness of the cream, delicious. Now I'm gonna finish this up. That is day one in Warsaw complete. Thank you so much for joining me. Hopefully you learned something new maybe when we went around the uh, Warsaw Uprising Museum. It was fascinating, but there is more to come because I will have day two as well so make sure you like and subscribe and stick around for the next video. Dovidenia. Virginia.